So, um, hello everybody. Thanks very much for coming along today. I mean, it's such a lovely day outside and it might be you know, not the best thing to be indoors. Um, before I start my talk um, properly, I'm just going to quickly flip through uh, the first nature journal, um, which I've digitised from one end to the other, just to give you an idea of what it is I've been falling through. Um, and so I'm just going to quickly just flip through, okay, before I go on about a selection. As you can see, some of it's quite faded and difficult to see. But this is just to give you an idea of the way my dad's journaling was. And he was um, just 14 <coughs> years old when he kept this journal. Um, I had to sort of, <laughs> I'd pull lots of bits out and, uh, but as you can see, there's uh, cuttings from newspapers, there's drawings, there's endless lists uh, and observations and some little paintings. And so as you can see, his handwriting's changing. And you see how it's getting smaller and smaller. He's got so much to say that <laughs> gradually that handwriting is just shrinking. <laughs> until it becomes the handwriting of his grown-up self. Um, I'll tell you a bit more about this journal in a minute. But anyway, I just thought you should just share <laughs> uh, the kind of extent, really, of his musings, collections at that very young age. And that there, that's the catalogue, you know, puts a lovely appendix, a catalogue, all, you know, beautifully. Uh, referenced uh, and even when he's finished he carries on <laughs> oh I've got another page let's put something else on there oh look I found this plant oh more on my bird data I'll tell you about his bird data which is quite amusing but also amazing so that's that was his first journal and um, so I just thought I'd have to show you that because otherwise you won't understand what I'm trying to do um, because it, it was slightly overwhelming uh, trying to decide what to show you today. Um, so, uh, yes, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, I am the youngest child of Ted Mills. <coughs> and I thought I would just start with Ted's early life. Um, he was born in Guernsey in 1909. This is him here, that one. That's his brother Martin. That's his mum Alice. That's his half-brother Percy and his father Jimmy. And um, that's about 1913 that photograph was taken. And uh, go on to the next slide. Oh, wrong, wrong computer. Get the right computer. Um, you can read that for yourselves. I don't like reading things off slides. So I'd rather you read that. And then I'll just talk about what I think about it. So... He spent his childhood wandering around the cliffs and studying rock pools. And there he is with his brother Martin, his little fishing net, and some poor girl who was tasked with looking after him for the day, probably paid pittance. But there they are. And, um, you know, I've got very happy memories of, of having holidays in Guernsey because obviously we went back there. So I've got a really strong memory of these places as well, which um, I think very fortunate to have. And uh, there's a bit more from the idyllic childhood of Ted and Martin with their pet goats. <laughs> there's even a photograph of them sitting in their goat cart, which is basically an adapted perambulator <laughs> with a goat pulling it. Um, so I guess his dad must have had a camera. It must be Jimmy. I, you know, I might even still have it. I've got a couple of old, really ancient cameras, so I wouldn't be surprised if they're Jimmy's cameras. And his brother Martin, he became a mycologist. So my dad's kind of specialism in the end, although he was one of those people, those extraordinary people, who, you know, he can recognise a flower, he can tell you, you know, the Linnaean term for it. He could tell you what insects would visit that flower if it was one of those flowers. He could tell you what kind of soil it grew in. And um, he could probably tell you what climate it liked and um, what birds fed on the insect. You know, he had that kind of incredibly connective data brain. Um, but his great love was micro fungi and his brother also. So his brother, I think he ended up as head of the Mycological Institute, if not head of it, at least very senior. So there they are, little boys, looking at my new life. And, and uh, 
how well it suited them. But they moved from their idyllic life in Guernsey to um, Yarmouth when, they were, when Ted was 11 years old. I'm just going to say a little bit about Ted's parents because I think it's relevant to his journal keeping. Because, you know, he always painted in Drew, so did Martin. Uh, you know, observing life and, and painting it, watercolours particularly. So this is a picture of one of my grandmother's, his mother's watercolours, Alice. Now, Alice, her father and her grandfather were French chronometer and watchmakers, immigrants. Her grandmother on that, her mother on that side <laughs> was, uh, yeah, Alice's mother came from a family of Nottingham lace makers. And I don't know, this kind of detailed observation was something that she had. And I've got to say, my sister paints just like this. And it's just, I, I don't know if it's genetic or whether it's cultural, it's nature and nurture possibly. And then, um, and I'll just say about Jimmy, I haven't got anything really much to say about him except that um, he, he came from a family of tailors. Uh, he was a rebel. He ran away to sea when he was 15. He sang his way around America. And he ended up in San Francisco in 1904 uh, when the big earthquake happened. And he was out on a paddle steamer in the bay playing the piano and singing you know, rude songs probably. And then, <laughs> so he went home then. But, so, but he was obsessed with data collection. So he, he, he used to test the kind of Mendel's theories about um, you know, cross, cross breeding hens and legumes and, you know, and he would keep detailed notes. So my dad had in parents these kind of people who had a lot of detail, both in their visual world and in uh, recording things, really. And I'll just do one more of grandma's things. Grandma, in later life, she took to making these embroideries. And she literally made embroideries as a person does watercolours. So I've got some of the stuff that she was working on when she died. And she literally had charcoal marks on a bit of, you know, old cloth, basically. And she'd just be sewing into it. Um, you know, um, she, you know, extraordinary, really. Um, so hang on, I've got my, I've got to get my notes up here. Anything else on this? Um, not really, no. I'll go on to the next one. I don't know if you can read this, but I'm going to read it to you because um, this is Dad's child writing um, in, was it, 1923? So he was 14 when he wrote this. So it's sort of current with that, um, that journal that he began to write. <clears throat> I did make a little one minute film out of this, which um, I'll give to, uh, give to you later. Okay, I'm gonna read it. So, that height of blue, ever reaching, all containing expanse of eternity. How unfathomable are its innumerable mysteries, how overpowering is its awful grandeur. And yet at times, how serenely calm and beautiful is its influence on the sunny summer's day. At night, the ever twinkling golden stars, the cool and heavenly limelight of the moon play their soft rays of peace upon the sleeping world. And the heavens appear like a gold spangled canopy of black, enveloping the earth in slumber. A faint golden hue mingled with a rosy light begins to spread along the east horizon. Here and there, a feathery cloudlet reflects a warm pink hue as a reminder that old Sol is coming up again. And presently, the sun himself appears in all his golden splendour and the world wakes to another glorious day. <laughs> and um, this is an essay he wrote at school and he got an A for it. I'm not really surprised. But what comes across there is that in the very brief schooling that he had between the ages of 11 and 14 he had a teacher who had a poetic sensitivity um, and I think you know my, my dad's style was quite sentimental and quite flowery almost Victorian in some ways but then if you think when he was at school in Galston at that time that would have been the style for nature writing um, and something that really got me when I found this in an old notebook I mean I only found this couple of years ago and was absolutely su surprised uh, you know at, at the level of language that he could command at that age <clears throat> and um, it reminded me that when he was 77 and dying in hospital he could only see a little bit of the sky through the skylight in his room and the last article he wrote for the Guardian um, Country Diary was very almost identical to this essay that he wrote when he was only 14 years old um, it's really similar. He was just talking about, you know, the sun and the day and, you know, it's so similar. It's almost as if he just remembered writing this. 
Um, okay, so about this time, very much this time, was when my dad met with Arthur Patterson, who he's called an amateur naturalist, but it was, he was a naturalist. I hate this word amateur. And you can read that for yourself. All right? There's something that dad said about Arthur Patterson, which I think is really important. And I'd just like you to read that. I'm not going to read it out. When you've read that, I'll say something else. Um, so, one of the things that Dad did as a teenager is he literally learnt to type. He went and did his Pitman's 1880s and learnt to type. And he became Arthur Patterson's typist. And he typed out the books that Patterson published for him. And he also became his you know, close acolyte. And there are numerous entries in all his journals that capture in detail their walks together at all times of day and night and their conversations and their observations. And one of the entries that I found <laughs> was six pages long and it was just relating an unsuccessful all day search for a bitten <laughs> in that tiny writing. Six pages long. I thought, when are they going to find the bitten? It was like, well, we didn't find the bitten, but we had a lovely time. We saw these 500 other things. Um, so a bit more about Arthur Patterson, because he's such an important figure in the fact that my father kept journals. Um, this is one of his um, cartoons for the paper, and that's Arthur Patterson. I don't know who's in the pram, but they are Norfolk fauna. I like that it's Walter Rye, whoever he is, in Clarendon Road, in Norwich. And uh, Arthur Patterson called himself John No Little. That was his nom de plume. And um, he was also a puppeteer, and he wrote and illustrated articles on natural history for local papers, but he gave shadow puppet shows and popular entertaining talks on all manner of subjects. And as well as inheriting his newspaper per article slot, when his dad took over from Arthur Patterson in terms of writing in the countryside, down nature spiders, all those articles that he wrote for the press, um, he, they got that on the back of Arthur Patterson. So when Arthur Patterson died, dad just popped straight in there, aged 18. Um, but there was a lovely thing, these, these little bits that I found, and I'll just read, because I don't think you can probably read them, I'm sorry about that, it's difficult to make them readable on the screen. Um, so this is when Arthur Patterson, in 1927, he's beginning to fail a bit, he's not so well. And the doctor's told him he can't do a talk. So the one at the bottom is a little note that Arthur has sent to Ted, uh, no, sent to, not to Ted, to the Parish Men's Club in Great Yarmouth. He says, John Nolittle, who has promised to give you a talk, has come out on strike. His doctor tells him not to spout like the case to whale, but write all he likes. So practically asked me to act as a soul of a black leg and fill his place. <laughs> and then I found the whole talk. Dad had typed it all out and put it in his journal. But at the top, at the top it says, this is what he said to the men in the, in the uh, Yarmouth um, Parish Men's Club. Had Mr. Patterson been feeling fit, he would have popped along here tonight and given us one of his old-time jolly entertainments. But as he's not permitted by his good doctor to be so energetic, now he has overstepped the age of three score years and ten, you will have to put up with his understudy for an hour. To prepare this little lecture at his request, I've been running through natural history notes which my pen scribbled from day to day on the delights of the fresh countryside and the wide seaway when I've been amongst the bright-eyed birds. So that's Ted at 18, standing in for Arthur. So I think what you can see from that is there was a great love and shared interest between these two men, well, the boy and the man. And so I think these journals really, I have to, you know, really have to thank Arthur Patterson for, you know, the, the interest that he showed in a young, a young lad with a very um, obsessive nature. Um, so I've, I've run through this particular journal with you before, so you've seen all what's in there really. Um, and I've picked various things, but this is the note at the beginning of the journal. So this is what he says about it, and you can read that, I don't need to read that out. Let's give you a little while just to read that. A 
I think what's particularly interesting is that that age, he's very, very clear that he thinks that accurate data collection is important. I think it's extraordinary, isn't it? You know, to make sure that you can say, yes, this is right. You know, I, I'm not telling you any untruths. You know, I think my dad was very keen on truth. Um, he wouldn't like it around here these days, I'll tell you what. Anyway. <laughs> He'd be shouting at the television, scoundrel! <laughs> <laughs> Seen him do it before. Um, okay, so this is kind of a typical thing. I thought I'd bring this out. It's quite early in the journal. Um, so he's used a bit of his uh, school exercise book to draw the guillemot, and then he's cut it out and stuck it down, and then done a bit of watercolour painting. He's labelled it, you know, summer plumage, you know? Yeah, get it right. Yeah, all the detail. And then underneath, he says, these birds are commonly washed up dead on Galston Beach during the winter. Notes, 20, 32, 45, 68, 82, 84, 86, 108. Oh, I can't even read that one. 109, 120, 100. Anyway, it goes on and on, all these notes. So I thought, he's got to be having a laugh. And I checked. And they were, all of those notes in his, in his journal had something about a guillemot. And that was one that I picked out. Guillemot. I watched one preening its feathers on the beach near the tide mark, south of Galston, on the 2nd of June. They, and some of them, are, you know, they're all different, but every single time he's mentioned a guillemot, he's got a note. So this first little journal is full of all this data collection, which I'll show you a bit more of. I'm afraid this is a bit burnt out because it was so faded. But what you can see here, he created a catalogue of birds that have been observed in Norfolk by him, by the way, by Biggs. He didn't say that, but they're all by him. There are hundreds of them. And in these lists, it's got, I don't know if you can see this, it says T, an asterisk, C. It's got these little codes that he puts by. So I thought, what's he mean by this? And I found, I found the code breaking thing. This is a code breaking document, which you can't see very well. Um, I'm afraid it's a bit burnt out. So I'll just give you some of the code breaking. Asterix means that I've seen them alive or found them dead. G means I have eaten that species. E means I have an egg in my collection of that species. And S means I've skinned or stuffed that specimen locally procured. T means I've found the bird at the tide mark dead. C means I've observed it in captivity. And F means I have a collection of the feathers. And it goes on, there's an awful lot more than that. So I'll just give you those, because otherwise it'll take all day. There's one I do like, which is A, accidental. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, and so again, from the first journal, this is, he's done this on, this is very typical. So he had the journal, but if he'd written all this out on another bit of paper on location, he'd just stuff it in, which I think is great. So he's not bothering to kind of, redo it for somebody else it's for him and um i'm going to read this out if that's okay i'm sorry I'm, my voice is not as good as his um but here he's you know, he's drawn a little diagram of what he means and that's the beginning of what he says i won't read that bit so you can read that bit um, and this was in december so it'd be jolly cold out there on the beach and i think in the evening um, what have I written now? Up to the unusual event. Okay, so this is the unusual event. I'm just going to just read this because of the detail. The ledge was covered with green and brown seaweeds. The rocky base was covered by thousands of dark mussels tightly packed together and countless numbers of tiny light brown mussels were clinging to some of the la lower parts. Quite a lot of whelks, very varied in tints, were there waiting for the tide. A few limpets were hard stuck on the rocks among the mussels. In the fissures lay a great many starfish, little and big, of the five rayed variety, brightly hued in various orange, red and pink colours. Almost as plentiful as the mussels were to be found acorn barnacles, many of them fastened onto the mussel shells. Masses of the sandy tubes of Sabellas were accumulated around the base of the breakwater and very beautiful they looked. Here and there I found giant sea slugs on the sides of the wave-worn shore with lumps of creamy jelly stuff, which I thought might be their eggs among them. In one spot, I saw some scarlet lumps of jelly-like substance on the rock. A few small clusters of whelks' eggs were to be found here and there, a few polyps, at least two varieties, and three kinds of anemones were hidden in various nooks and crannies. I found only a small number of crabs of three kinds. One, shore crabs, two, edible crabs, small, 
and three, a kind of pea crab which burrows quickly in sand. Also, I observed from beneath a boulder on the sand a queer little creature of this form. That's a little queer creature. <laughs> That's less than half an inch wide, that, <laughs> that little creature. Um, so he's, I think that's what he had. It's this phenomenal observation of all the detail. He's not happy until he's made a note of everything, is he? You know, I don't know how long it took him. Probably not that long either. I'm going to go on to what I call stories. There's lots and lots of stories in the journal. So there's, there's the data collection, there's the observation, detailed observation, and then there are stories. Um, and this is... There are some of them very cruel stories. There's quite a lot of stories about um, animal cruelty, really. Well, especially now, we think, you know, it's incredibly cruel. But, of course, we're talking about, you know, 1920s, when, you know, country folk did what country folk did, and they probably still do. So this is a story about rat hunters. And uh, the reason I've, it's very short. I'm not going to take them too long to read this bit. Um, but what amazes me... <laughs> is that, you know, he's walking, he's, he's only a teenager, you know, he's walking back from Keswick Aviaries to Norwich, he walked everywhere, in the night, and he sees some light. I, I don't know about you, if I saw some light on a haystack, I don't think I'd be walking across the field to find out what it was. He's like, oh, I wonder what that is, off I go, you know, go see what's happening here. Um, so he says, near Keswick, near supper time, I lengthened my walk from Norwich by turning into a field at the roadside to satisfy my curiosity over two small lights, which kept flashing about a big barley stack. Two boys were rat catching in a novel way. I stopped to see the sport and with hopes of securing spoil, rats to wit, for our carnivorous birds in the Keswick aviaries. He was working at the Keswick aviaries. The boys were friendly and showed me the really splendid homemade weapons of the hunt fashioned thus walking stick and a spike. <laughs> they directed the rays of the electric torches into the jutting tufts of barley bundles and upon detecting the beady gleam of a rat's eye between the stalks, they vigorously thrust the prodding instruments at the mark and often succeeded in hauling out an impaled rodent. So that's, that's quite a big story, isn't it? You know, it says an awful lot. So he's working at the Avery, so he needs live animals to feed these carnivorous birds. Um, at um, Keswick Hall um, and he's, you know, he's got his eye out for something else and I'm just going to do a bit more on animal cruelty I'm afraid, sorry about this but there's a lot of it in there yeah. and actually my father was you know, dead against animal cruelty so I think it taught him an awful lot of lessons at this time and what I would say is he, he writes quite a lot in the vernacular so these old boys this is an old boy who worked with him at Keswick Aviaries, I don't know, might have been a gardener or I don't know what it was, but um, this is a story that this old boy at Keswick told him. I'll try and do it in the Norfolk accent. My dad did it very well in the Norfolk accent. And I, you know, apologies um, if it sounds patronising to this. When I was young, I used to speak with quite a Norfolk accent myself. <clears throat> this is what he said. Old X, what used to sell meat to Yarmouth Market was a devil for cruelty. I seen him once killing a bullock. He take the pullax, chop off his nose, cheek and an eye before slaughtering the poor beast. Yet that fellow himself would yell out for the least knock he got. I'll tell you, Yarn, let you see what a shrinking coward he can be sometimes. Well, me and a few other men used to catch rats in them days about the town. We wanted them alive as a rule to send away for training dogs. Who knew? One day we went to search the old slaughterhouse, taking along with us a few dogs and ten ferrets. We have got to drive the varmin into sacks. We hunt the ground floor, but they didn't see me none there, and the dogs kept sniffing upwards, so I says to X, who's usually about the place, what have you got up in there, the lofts? There's a few trusses of hay, he says, that's where the rats have been engaged into, says I. So, we went up and was soon rousing them. X was told to hold a sack for a little, and the rats come to, began to come out, and one of them ran up his trousers, and he dropped the sack. He turned that white, and he screeched like a whipped thief. <laughs> what got you, we shouts out. But still he carried on till one of us took it out. I wonder how many times we've had a rat run up our legs. Some score, I reckon. But we always had flat pockets where we can put our hands down and grab the varmint. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, yeah, so, uh, yeah, Dad, Dad wrote in the, you know, in, in the Norfolk Act, he wrote dogs and, you know, varmint and all of that sort of thing. So the other thing I put there, because I couldn't find an illustration for this, was... Um, 
a study that he made of a, of a game <coughs> of a gamekeeper's gibbet. So he wasn't just sort of drawing pretty pictures of birds, he was going out into the woods and drawing that on the spot into his journal. It's not something he pasted in, it, you know, he takes it with him. Um, okay, what time is it? Okay, that's right. I thought I'd put in a nice story after that. <laughs> um, I won't read all of this because it's a very long story. Um, I, I, the only reason I have to read it is because I don't think you can read it. Despite his beautiful writing, it's really hard to pick it out. Um, but this is, there's just a, I'll just pick some of these things out. Uh, and it's just his story. He went on the choir outing to Cossie and, and the Back River and they had a lovely day. And this is his version of a lovely day. I'll just read some of it. The day was warm and bright, leaving Galston about 10 o'clock in the morning. We went by Charabank along the Beckles Road through Fritton, St Olives, Haddiscoe, Loddon, and thence to Norwich, through that city, along the Deerham Road, turning off into Cossie. See, got to have everything. <laughs> On arrival, we straightway went down to the river at the back of the Bull Inn. Until dinner time, I hunted about the riverbank and waded along the shallow margin of the river, where there were countless shoals of tiny, tiny roach and some gudgeon. On the grasses, various plants along the bank, teleferous, bicoloured beetles were very plentiful, and I found a very beautiful and strangely marked kind of weevil abundantly on the figwork plants. Anyway, carries, oh, I like this bit, actually. Some wonderful dragonflies were to be seen with those brilliant blue-green bodies and black and green shaded wings. I think their gleaming gem-like magnificence rivals that of the cling, kingfisher. Not the kingfisher, the kingfisher. So, he, you know... It's all about, you know, the joy of finding this thing. And he, he, there he is, poking around. I mean, everybody else is at the Bull Inn, you know, having a pint of beer or, you know, whatever, jam sandwiches. And he's there. And later on, um, dinner time came and we repaired to the rustic tea gardens for a good meal. In the afternoon, I went by boat further down the river, was left on the bank to have a search for things. <laughs> I took my boots and socks off and rolled up my trousers and waited. Waited. Why did I say waited? At one part, I could go almost halfway across the river. It was so shallow with a gravelly bottom. Though for the most part, the water was too deep and the bottom too muddy for me to be able to venture far out. Then he lists a load of things. Vivipara contectus snail. I don't know what these are. Limnia auriculoria, empty shells in the water. Numerous fishy caught. And he, in his little net, he obtained a few beetles from the, from the shore. A boat came. I went back to the Bull Inn for a strawberry tea out on the bowling green. Blah, blah. Anyway, um, just to give you an idea. So they all go out in this chair bank. Everybody else, I'm sure, they're just hanging around, having a picnic. Dad, shoes off, in the river. What can I see? You know, my <laughs> glass. It just sort of gives you an insight, really, to what he... What he um, thought was more important, which I'm glad he did. Uh, so I love this particular small story where he's, where he's comparing a grasshopper to a weevil. And the reason I put this in is because I think this kind of thinking is why he did so well with his um, discovering, actually discovering microfungi that nobody else had ever spotted. And I think he's always thinking, well, why does, why would that be there? So later in life, you know, his big sort of big thing really was the innovation was discovering that there was a fungus on the catkins of the bog myrtle. So he came across this idea because he's going, hmm, there's fungus on catkin. Every catkin has got a host fungus, but nobody's looked at the catkins of the bog myrtle because it's too small, they can't be bothered, can they? <laughs> and he found it. And I think that the beginnings of this thinking are kind of in this little, uh, small observation. The other thing, I, you can't see this because I've blown it up in case you can read it, but um, he had a very strict margin system. So he always left a margin at the side of everything. So on this, it'll say grasshoppers, weevils next to it. So he can go and find that quite easily. His subjects are always in the margin. And I think that's just such a great thing to do with your notebooks. I just wish I'd taken his um, advice and done that myself these days. So he says, colonies of tiny grasshoppers were along a sunny bank down the lane. As I passed very slowly between Intwood Run and Swarston Common, they were chocolate brown with a creamy mark on the back. I've recently seen a few little green grasshoppers of the same size on woodnut leaves. 
As an instance of the varied resources of nature in protecting things, I like to think of the grasshopper and a weevil type of beetle as opposite extremes. The former has developed strong jumping limbs wherewith to escape, while the beetle really relaxes its hold of whatever plant it may be on and trusts to luck that it will fall into hiding among the mazy entanglements of undergrowth. This latter trait I consider very marvellous in a creature so lowly, but then they have the ant and bee with their countless, countless exhibitions of resourcefulness. But is that lovely, you know, trying to compare insects' behaviour with each other, just one aspect of their behaviour, and then finding this um, polarity? It's really great. So another aspect of the journals, which goes all the way through, is, um, is map making. Uh, trying to create an image to tell you about an event which has directions, time, location. Um, you know, he's only a kid. <laughs> he's trying so hard. I mean, I think, you know, the, the wonders of modern um, computer graphics, you know, in a way, maybe that's what he would have done if he was alive now. <laughs> Who knows? So he's got a vivid recount of a story told him by Mr. Brooks. It's another of his local connections. Um, and I'll just tell you the little, it's only a short observation. One day this week, Mr. Brooks saw a flock of herons coming from a northwesterly direction over the marshes. The birds were making an awful noise. I don't know if you've heard herons. I heard one the other day going over the marsh and it was, it really was almost like a mechanical toy. I mean, it's like an incredible grating, almost a metallic sound. So 50 of them, I mean, goodness. I don't know what I'd do. I'd have to put some, something in my ears. Anyway, this flock of herons was coming from a northwesterly direction of the marshes. The birds were making an awful noise and toppled and twitched in their flight, like as if they was drunk. <laughs> as they approached the reed bed at the junction of the rivers Waveney and Yare with Braden, the antics alarmed the wild ducks who, which frequent and breed in that spot, and a flock of about 50 mallards sped off. Four shell ducks were also put up from the riverside, and the whole flock of birds moved southwesterly and passed over, I think it says Torrey's Fen, but if somebody could probably put me right on that. The herons alighted in the wood close by and continued their ridiculous noise making. He's right. The shell ducks continued till they reached the heather land to the south, while the mallards wheeled around towards the marsh again. So this little map is to tell you all of that story in a graphic form. These are all the birds flying. And then this is, it says, there's another note. Herons were in the wood again, two days later. You know, so he's keeping up with the story. When he tells a little story, he's, He's making sure that he finds out if it develops in other ways. And you know, there's probably somewhere where it says what he did with the rats, you know. <laughs> Not only maps, but drawings and paintings. Um, and what I say is, you know, later on he illustrated his own articles. And what I say about the journals, I've, I've only got these journals up to 1928. And what I say about that is that from then on, he was writing weekly or bi-weekly articles, which he was also illustrating. And I would say that those took the place of his journals. So I, I see all his articles that he wrote from then on as just being a continuation of his journaling. I mean, he did have little notebooks and, you know, a small diary, literally a pocket diary like that, which he wrote stuff in. I mean, you can't read it, really. You'd have to have a microscope to read it, I think. But um, uh, uh, it just moved into the public sphere in that form. So Dad had no formal training. He just learned by observing and doing. He was an autodidact, and his experience working at Keswick Hall Avery's is well documented throughout his journal. So he started working there when he was about 15, I think. Uh, and there's a note. Um, so I couldn't find a picture of a. I couldn't find a picture of an Indian adjutant stalk. I'm rather sorry that I could. I looked through. I just could not find a picture of one in there. So I thought I'll just leave it without a picture. But this is his thoughts on death really. Um, he was very upset. He, was, he really loved this, this big old stork. He loved this stork. And um, there was another man who worked at the aviaries who he thought was a very cruel person. Um, I'll say something about that. But one of the things that Dad would do, would he entertain us a lot with bird calls. He could do a lot of bird calls. His favourite was the laughing jackass from, from when he worked at the aviaries. Uh, which and the other, I'll just tell you a little story actually, yeah, about him making a lot of noise. Um, Mum and Dad were alone in the house, and it was uh, first of September when shooting starts, 
and they could hear some poachers, that, well, actually I think it was before the shooting star, they could hear some poachers in the wood uh, and it was a full moon and mum was in the kitchen, dad said I'm going to go and frighten them and he went out into the woods and he bayed to the moon, right, <laughs> real nasty baying to the moon and they could hear, she could hear the dogs whimpering <laughs> ran away. <laughs> so there you go, he had quite a loud voice when he, when he needed it. Yeah, so that's Bane to the Moon. Um, so here, in a transcript of a letter to a friend, he considers the soul of a bird as he looks at its dead body, cast on the ground by the uncaring Mr Jessup. So in this letter to a friend, he said, you'll be sorry to hear that poor John William, the large stork, died this Thursday morning. The solitary old bird has not been over well for a couple of months. He disgorged all his food during the last few days of his life, and this morning he sank down, and after a few minutes he lay his poor old head on the floor, dying without a flutter. I went to lunch, but when I returned, Mr Jessup told me, with rather a vicious, triumphant air, that he'd hold the stinking old bee outside, and said that where he'd been laying, I smelt fit to prison anyone, and weren't healthy for nobody nor nothing to keep him. So perhaps his appearance, says Dad, was grotesque, but his eyes revealed a human spirit, all the daylight hours, those eyes expressed a multitude of thoughts, wonder, reflection and pleasure. And this is where he gets very sentimental. He says, the old bird is now a memory. Tonight, when the moon shone above, I stood for a little while by the dead stalk where he lay on the grass, just as Mr Jessup had roughly flung him. Many thoughts I had. Surely the life spark of John William did not lie there on the grass. There must be room for it still somewhere in the utter infinity of the universe. Room for boys? Room for birds. Yes, yes, yes. So he's like, you know, trying to cheer himself up, really, and thinking about the spirit of the bird. Um, so, yeah, so he obviously, well, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit later about um, wild menageries, because uh, Dad certainly was an, <laughs> a keeper of wild menageries. What I did find, uh, as well as the journals, was an early collection of his chirp articles. So this is when he was sort of, infringing on Arthur Paston's territory and beginning to write articles under the name of Chirp, which I think is delightful. Uh, 1928, I think this is. So this, uh, this article, the first article he wrote as Chirp, which is it's a shame, he's kind of roughly torn it out here. So here on this page in his, I suppose it's a journal of sorts, I think it is a journal, really. he's been looking at children's rhymes and then he's written a short article about sort of the natural world and children's rhymes. It's absolutely delightful. And then he's also written here, when it was published, and then little notes about what people said. The, uh, the above is the first time I used this little pen, uh, pen name, which I hope will always, which something, oh, his mother suggested. Okay, his mother suggested he calls himself Cher. <laughs> So there's lots and lots of other information about this article and how it came about. It's a research page, as well as a, a sort of feedback page. And um, so on the back of this, I'm just going to read... Um, so what I'm going to read out here is something that Dick Meadows, who's now the chair of the Ted Ellis Trust, um, he wrote some synopses about Dad for his centenary in uh, 2009. And so I'm quoting some of these because he did a, such a good synopsis. So. By 1928, in fact it was 1927, <laughs> Ted is writing short articles for the Eastern Evening News and the Eastern Daily Press under pseudonyms like Chirp on subjects, subjects ranging from children's rhymes to gulls, bats and hedgerow flowers and the need to keep footpaths open. <laughs> he gains a temporary job at the Toll House Museum, helping, helping with a summer exhibition and it brings him to the attention of those who are thinking of creating a new post. And Ted is made Natural History Assistant at the Castle Museum, Norwich, its first professional naturalist. That's a bit later. I'd say that's the, because that's David Attenborough, Timothy Coleman and me dad. Look at me dad there, what is he? 60 or something. That's probably very late on, just before he uh, stopped working there. It might even have gone back for it. Anyway, so what did he do as a museum naturalist? Um, he created those dioramas of local landscapes and flora and fauna. And he was the first person in this country to do that. He, he heard about it, people doing it in America, and he commissioned those dioramas. Uh, he created miniature models of allotments for the war effort, showing people how to make the most of their garden. So little he made little cabbages and carrots and 
and it made all these models. Literally, he made all these tiny models. And so, you know, he had all these little skills, still miniature, miniature skills. He answered endless natural history queries and he curated huge collections, including taxidermy and butterflies. Actually, he left the museum's employment in 1956 and became a self-employed writer and broadcaster for the rest of his life. But he still had quite a lot of links with the castle. So that's where I come in a bit. So that's me, that one. Okay. I'd like you to see that we've all got gum our gum boots on. Okay. So that's 1960. <laughs> It's a very poor photograph, I'm afraid it's, it's, it's tiny and I didn't get a very good image of it. But that is my mum and dad and all my brothers and sisters. And that's how we were, really. That's, that was our life. Living in this damp cottage with no running water or electricity, wearing gumboots. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, ha it had some good things about it too. Uh, I just make it sound bad. Uh, and, uh, yeah, they're pioneers, aren't they? Look at them. Those, those parents. So this is a bit about Dad and the Wild Menagerie. Um, I remember this heron, and I remember, look, he's holding a fish. I remember my dad sort of holding fish and sort of going through to the bathroom, having found some disgusting fish, stinking the house out, and go, oh, the heron will love this. And he's like marching through the house, you know, these cumboots with a, these muddy cumboots with a disgusting fish to feed the heron who's in the bathroom, but I've got to tell you, there were no taps in the bathroom that worked. I mean, we literally had to, we, we had a Rayburn with a very, very small boiler, and you'd literally get half a bucket of hot water out of it, and you'd carry that through to the bathroom. But yeah, for however long the heron was in the bathroom, we didn't have any baths. Heron took precedence. And um, yeah, lots of stories. So at that time, you know, around that time, we also had a room that was dedicated to a, an owl somebody had found. Um, and we used to have to go and pick up roadkill uh, for this for this owl and drag it around the floor so it thought it was alive yeah. <laughs> and uh, collect its pellets and have a look at them and see what was in them that was all good fun and what else we had a bittern in an outhouse who also had some injury and um, my dad had filled it with lots of reed that he must have stuck into something you know so they thought it was in the reed you go in and the, her and the bittern would be there pretending it wasn't there it was standing very still you really hadn't got frightened the bittern yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think a little bit more on wild menageries because there's some of that in his journals so this one he's put a relic at the top and he written, he'd written this in 1923 and then he pasted, found it and pasted it in his journal in 1924 and he's obviously this is his look at his childish writing this is before he developed his grown up writing so it's quite old and I'll just tell you a bit about what it says on that one which is uh, so yes, pets I have kept. Charlie, a favourite viviparous lizard, was caught after much trouble in Lone Pit Lane on Saturday the 29th of April 1922, and he became very tame in a short while. He had a large number of unlizard-like adventures. He travelled in trains and river steamers, and he even flew on a kite to a good height. <laughs> as well as accompanying me on all my country excursions, always being carried on my hand. Lowestoft, Gunton, Corton, Lamb, Ashbees, and Olives, Fritton, Bradwell, Borough Castle, Yarmouth, Hopton, Galston, Golflings were all visited by him while his home was in a large vivarium in my garden, along with his fellow lizards and William the Slow Worm. Mm -hmm. And he goes on about William the Slow Worm. Um, and the, uh, the other picture here is of a gecko that Mr. Patterson had given him. Uh, there's a bit of a story attached to this. So he keeps the gecko and he feeds it on blue bottles and it seems to be quite healthy. And he gives it to another guy called Dick. Uh, there's a note under there, which I, I'm afraid I haven't got. But this guy, Dick, who was his friend, became a professor uh, of something to do with animals at Cambridge University. Uh, and so you, you just think about these kids, they're just like kids, and they're both like interests, but for very <coughs> different reasons. Um, and you know, you think, well, you know, what a culture there was in that little place at that little time with these children who are so interested in, in nature and animals and, you know, how, how to keep them alive. Um, right, so I'll move on. So, um, just so I thought this was a nice picture, really. This is how I remember my dad. There's a microscope. He's got a paintbrush. He's got a saucer. He's got a very, very old box of very dried up old water paints. She's trying to get some colour out of. 
um, and he's surrounded by books and just rubbish really you know uh, to other people it'd be rubbish not to him and what was he doing he was doing these rather beautiful detailed drawings as well and he did these all with either a mapping pen or later on he had a repeater graph I think um, but you know I remember him drawing with a mapping pen uh, and so some of his articles he illustrated I think nature's byways and I think he did one illustration week in the countryside as well and I did find hundreds of these um, and they're all they've all got a bit of tracing paper over the top and that says 55 percent there because in those days if you were illustrating something you had to say uh, what percentage scale it would need to be reproduced at to put in the article so you had to do maths as well I remember doing that I did my graphic design degree um, so he also um, my brother John in the 1960s gave my dad a Pentax camera and there my dad went mad with the Pentax camera and he left over 20,000 slides mainly of natural history subjects which we still have and we are just trying to work out what the hell to do with them they're, they're all positive agfa colour slides and there are 20,000 possibly more well I'm sure there's more uh, most of them are actually in envelopes and labelled but he labelled all his slides They've all got the date, what it is, and the Latin name. Every single one is labelled with all the data. So it's a remarkable collection, but nobody's really given us uh, any clues about what to do with it. And uh, I've got a student who I've uh, been lending them to. She's been digitising them and using as part of her VJ sets. So at least they're being sort of brought out in some thing, but you know. So the pad, there's some of the, I mean, he's got a whole load of slides I've got in my studio just on pictures he's taken of patterns in the ice or clouds or sunsets as well as, you know, little beetles and, uh, you know, um, wasps being eaten by parasitic fungi and things like that. <laughs> Those are things like that. So, um, so I, I'd say my dad had what you would call um, space cancer um, in that if there was any available surface in the house, it would be com completely covered in his stuff. So I don't know how my mother put up with it really, because you know that stuff might be dead animals, it might be dried up plants, it might not look important, but if you moved it, heaven help you, because he knew where everything was, even if it was layers and layers of stuff, he knew exactly where everything was. So you weren't allowed to touch anything or move anything. And sometimes there was nothing, there wasn't a surface to eat off because every table in the house was covered in his stuff. So that was a hall table where we were supposed to eat, right? But it was always like that. But you know, we all put up with that. It's, well, you know, he's doing quite a good job. We'll let him get on with it. Um, so again, um, I think this might be my last slide, it is. So I absolutely love this picture. This is my dad, aged 11, in a costume his, his mum made, uh, called Hatched in the Post. And um, I think it co covers a lot of things, really, in a way, because, um, you know, he wasn't shy of dressing up or being seen or being heard or, you know, he liked, actually, he loved, uh, we used to play charades at Christmas, I absolutely loved playing charades, you know, uh, you know, putting a stupid hat on and pretending to be someone else, all of that. So he always had a bit of the actor in him, which I think was encouraged by his mother, clearly. Um, but uh, I've got a nice synopsis from Dick Meadows, um, and he said this, because, uh, uh, well, actually, I'll say what I'll say first, which is I'd say that his early journals are testament to his feelings of responsibility for representing the natural world and sharing in that information with others. So that's what I'd say about it. Dick Meadows says, Ted's sense of the wholeness of nature and of humans as part of it led him at different times to active membership of a wide array of bodies, too many to list, but ranging from the River Board Pollution Committee, the Broads Authority Planning Committee, to Serlingham Parish Council, he brought to all of this work wide-ranging passions. He was vocal, for example, on planning, pollution, the erosion of banks on the broads, use of chemicals in agriculture and hedgerow maintenance. He wrote for The Guardian's Country Diary, was a regular broadcaster for BBC Look East and had his own programme on BBC Radio 3 from 1964 to 1970. And he, and he contributed performances to the National Weekend programme in the early 1980s. He died in 1986, writing his last article for The Guardian in his own last week of life. But that's, you know, that's what I like to think about, really. 
um, when he's writing these journals. That's, you know, he's having fun with it as well, isn't he? And he can, you know, he's sending himself up to a certain extent, isn't he? You know, as well. So he wasn't without humour uh, within his sort of serious pursuit of things that he thought were deadly important. That's it, really. So thanks very much. Thank you.